it is a pleasure to see each and every one of you here, especially the secondary school uh, students. We know it may have been a bit of a challenge to come because we know it's during exam season, but you all would not regret it and we have a lot in store. So firstly, I want us to become a little bit more warmed up for what we have in store, so I would like at least like around five people to tell me their name, the school they are coming from, their form, and one thing they believe to be true about actuarial science. So if, if persons don't volunteer, I'll volunteer for you persons. <laughs> so of course, as a, um, as a fellow St. Mary's College graduate, uh -oh. I will. Mr. Sarfati, you want to choose one of them, or you want me to choose them? OK. <laughs> a lot of math. That, that is true. A lot of math. Okay. <laughs> that is true. One more, another one? Even if you're from the, the actual science degree program, Shireen, you? <laughs> Name, degree, yeah. One thing. A lot of work, okay. 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 A lot of math, a lot of work, okay. I know we have Fatima College in the building right now, I had one person from Fatima, we'd like you to tell us. <laughs> Pays a lot of money. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll take, yes, we have Holy name there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, technically, you need to like maths if you want to go down this route. All right. So a lot of maths, and you have to like maths. OK. Two more people. Pushing okay. up the states, that's four. You said five. Okay. Very much in demand. Repeat the answer. Okay. So that was five out of five. Bonus, one more person. And we actual one more. Okay, see I see again. Well done. Problem solved. Repeat the answer for me. So, from St. Mary's College, he believes that in actuarial science, there's a lot of problem solving so, yeah. skills that are required, which is. Okay. Okay. So, again, my name is Nathaniel Gomes. I'm the president of the UE Actuarial Science Club at St. Augustine. And it, it's filled up a bit more now. We are very delighted to have each and every one of you here today. And again, I will say we have a lot in store. Keep your all's ears open because a lot of information is going to be passed today. So our esteemed guest is none other than the immediate past president of the SOE, the Society of Actuaries, which is the largest actuarial body in the world, holding over 30,000 actuaries. He's also a fellow graduate of the University of the West Indies, Moda Campus. Mr. Robinson holds titles of FSE, 
Fellow of the Society of Actuaries, MAAA, member of the Amer American Academy of Actuaries, and FCA, fellow chartered accountant. No, no. It's a fellow of the Conference of Consulting Actuaries. Hmm. Well, right. guys, Google can't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. It's okay. Yeah. He was the 74th president of the Society of Actuaries, being the first male of African descent to hold such a position. Mr. Robinson was also involved in creating the International Association of Black Actuaries, serving as its president from 2010 to 2013. He holds a bachelor's in mathematics from the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, a master's in statistics from the University of Delaware, and another master's in statistics from Florida State University. It is clear that Mr. Robinson has been a light to the world from the Caribbean, illustrating the potential and promise that we all have within us as Caribbean people. Today we are beyond grateful that he can be in our presence and relay some of the knowledge, the gems, and the wisdom he has amassed throughout his illustrious career. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hearty round of applause to Mr. John Robinson. Thank you. Okay, so you're gonna read the questions? Or? The way we structured this is what I call a scripted interview where he asks me some questions and I will provide the responses. And then after that, we will um, open it up to Q&A. So before, while he's figuring that out, um, I just want to thank you all for having me here today. Um, certainly is my privilege to share what I can of my experience with you and hopefully encourage you in, in your journeys uh, to either you know, complete a degree. It may lead to becoming an actuary. It may lead you elsewhere. Uh, but wherever that takes you, the foundation that you get from the University of the West Indies will be valuable to you. So I wish you all every success. You ready now? OK. All right. So the first question we have is the different types of actuaries or specialties there are. So most people would, would only be a, they would only think that there may be like life actuaries, health actuaries, and we know there are a large range of them. So. Mm -hmm. Can you shed some light on that for us? Okay, hold on. Let me show you something. Because I, I had some to these. Right? Because I'd sort of narrow them down to these and then have these here. All right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Start with which one? No. Yeah, yeah, let's start with here. All right. You have, you have these? Uh, or you just want to share this with me? Yeah. All right, let's do that. Okay, that'll make it easier so we're on the same page. All right. OK. We're getting the right questions in order. We have a large amount of questions. Right. I need, I need the notes, though, so for, don't go for, over. For after? Yeah. So. All right. I write notes to myself so that I don't forget anything. So just start with the first one. And then so, OK. Yeah. We can start simple. That was a bit. Yeah. What an actuary is, what an actuary does. Quite simple. All right. So what is an actuary, and what, is a, what does an actuary do? And why did I choose to become an actuary? And that's, that's an interesting story um, that I'm going to tell you today. So, so what is an actuary? Um, an actuary I will describe as a, and you may find this surprising, I describe an actuary as a business person who is applying a unique set of skills um, to traditionally the businesses of insurance and pensions. Um, the skills that we learn are mathematics, obviously. You need, you need that mathematical ability and that mathematical education. Statistics, otherwise these days al also called data science. Uh, economics is a part of it because some of the 
particularly in life insurance, you get into interest rates and, and, and other considerations. Um, we have to understand about investments, how assets, different types of assets, stocks and bonds, uh, mortgages and various other composite forms of, af of assets. Uh, we need to understand some of the bases, mathematical bases of quantitative finance, right? We also need to understand a little bit about the law. And why is that? That's because an insurance contract is a legal document. And so you do have to appreciate a little bit of what are the implications of that. The life insurance business in any country is fairly heavily regulated. And so the actuary has to be aware of all of the regulations that pertain to whatever, whatever subject matter, whatever products you're working on. If you are a health actuary, you need to know a little biology, how the human body works, and how that interacts with the insurance system that, you're trying to, that the company is trying to run. And of course, we all need computer skills of one sort, one sort or another, so computer science. Um, there are all kinds of new statistical languages that have come on stream since I did my my, my masters uh, that are available to you and you're going to find necessary um, if you're going to pursue a career as an actuary or in that if you're going to be numerate at all in the 21st century. What an actuary does is primarily around making sure that the company is solvent by establishing what are the appropriate amount of reserves that need to be held and the law requires that that function be performed by an actuary who is qualified to do so. Um, so that sort of creates a position, a demand for an actuarial role in, in the insurance business. Um, there are three, you know, I talked about reserving, but there's also pricing, just setting premium rates for various products. Um, there are also regulations and rules around that. And that should also be done by persons qualified to do that. Um, in the world of accounting, there is a, a balance sheet. Anybody here know what a balance sheet is? I see one. So in the world of accounting, a balance sheet, uh, and, and you can actually do a personal balance sheet. On one side, you have the assets, which are what, what the company or the entity owns. On the other side, you have the liabilities which are what the company, ways described what the company owes, all right? Now, if you're an insurance company, what you owe are essentially the dollar value of the promises that you have made to your policyholders. Does that make sense? All right, so your assets are stocks and bonds and whatever, and you have a value over here. Your liabilities include the value of the promises that you've made the dollar value of the promises you've made to your policyholders. And that's what they call reserves, and that's what the actuary calculates. But then the difference between those two is called, whoever knew the accounting, capital, otherwise known as surplus, all right? And so the question for surplus is, how much surplus should a company have, all right? So if I were to tell you that the Liabilities are $1,000, I'll keep it simple, and the assets are 1,001, then the surplus is, is $1. And I ask you, is that enough surplus? You have an answer? Why might it not be enough? Any thoughts? Well, you might have to call on that surplus. So for example, your $1,000 of reserves assumes a certain amount of experience, mortality experience. And let's suppose COVID hit and you had extra debts. All right? That's what your surplus is for, OK? So it gives rise to the question of what is the minimum surplus that a company needs to have, and that is an actuarial problem. So actuaries are involved in helping to establish what is the minimum surplus compared to the surplus that the company actually has, the reserves, and then, of course, the pricing, all right? So that's traditionally what we do um, for, for, for life insurance. Um, the first actuary that I met was Daisy Koch. 
She was, I think, the second actuary fellow in the Caribbean. She was a fellow of the Institute, um, got her fellowship in 1970. And I met her in 1974. And um, I didn't really think much about the, the actual profession at that time. I was at UAE uh, with Robin. He, Robin was a year ahead of me at UAE. And um, I wasn't really thinking much about it. And then I went and did a master's in statistics and, and uh, um, signed up for the PhD program in statistics at Florida State. And then I came to a crossroads. Anybody want a little romance in this story? All right, so I came to a crossroads. So in 1982, um, I turned 28, and I was at Florida State, and I had a beautiful honey waiting for me in Kingston. So at the same time, I was invited by a very eminent professor to do a PhD with him right, under his advice. PhD, statistics, I, I, I wasn't really turned on by research, to be honest, but there was that option to work with an eminent professor. So here are the choices. PhD, statistics, and I, it, it could have lead, led anywhere. I could get a job in industry as a statistician or academically as a statistician. The alternative, return to Jamaica, become an actor because I knew that was one of the few things I could do in Jamaica and continue the relationship with my Jamaican honey. So what should I choose? What would you choose? Jamaican honey. <laughs> well, I chose the honey. So that's why I became an actuary. No, it's not exactly why I became an actuary, but it was a part of the decision to become an actuary. And so I chose the profession at the time, not because I knew all about reserves and surplus and, and, and assets, uh, but because I was aware of the challenge that it presented, and I thought I could handle that challenge. And indeed, the, the bar for entry was not really that high in that sense. Um, nowadays, I would tell young people that if you're going to become an actuary and, and get into an insurance company or something, an actuarial employer, you need, to know, you need to do a lot more than what I had to do. The world has changed quite a lot. Uh, so in terms, of, in terms of why I chose it, um, that, that's kind of the story. It's all about the Jamaican honey. Mm hmm Okay. All right. So what's next? What do you want to do next? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so uh, the next question that um, Nathaniel asked me to address is about the Society of Actuaries. Um, what is the role of actuarial organizations, and in particular, what is the Society of Actuaries? So I'll talk a little bit about that. The actuarial profession was founded back in the 1800s. And um, there were a few people called actuaries who worked in, in life insurance companies. And once their numbers grew to what they considered you know, large enough, they decided to form themselves into actuarial organizations. And so that tradition has continued to this day. So the first, first such organization was the Institute of Actuaries in England that was founded in 1848. And there were, I, I was not able to find out um, how many people founded that. The second one was the Faculty of Actuaries in Scotland. And that was founded by, I think, 38 members about eight years later, 1856. The third one to be founded was in the United States. And that was then called the Actuarial Society of America. And it eventually became what is now the Society of Actuaries. And that was founded in 1889. So the actuarial profession from the beginning has tended to be built around groups of actuaries coming together to form an organization. Um, 
the whole idea of, of exams came along later because you know once you have a group, you have to figure out how are people going to get into the group. And so they created the whole process of doing exams. So it's a very old process um, as the way to become, become a fellow of whatever institution it is. Um, now, as the profession has evolved, the actual profession in any given country, or in, 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 in the case of the Caribbean Actual Association or region, um, basically has five different components. Uh, the first, you need to have some kind of credentialing process, some kind of process that says who is an actuary and you know, by, by converse, who is not. Um, the SOA has its own exams, the IFOA has its own exams, many institutions offer exams, but many don't. Uh, the Caribbean Actuarial Association does not, so the Caribbean Actuarial Association accepts members, people who have designations from other places. So you need some kind of educational process, credentialing process that identifies who is an actuary and who is not. You need a code of conduct. Any profession needs a code of conduct. It's a, usually just a three, four page document that lays out the principles and the rules that those members agree to live by and to be judged by, All right? So you need a code of conduct. You need standards of practice. Um, standards of practice is how, what is the appropriate way for actuaries to do things. And so in the US, we have a set of standards of practice. There are about 56 of them. And they address all different forms of insurance and all kinds of other related considerations. So as a profession, we have to adhere to those standards of practice. You also then need discipline. If someone does something that's wrong, there needs to be a mechanism whereby that person is brought to justice. And maybe they, it wasn't wrong after all, and they are uh, you know, acquitted, as it were, so to speak. Um, or there's other punishment, and the most egregious punishment that can be meted out is that you lose your designation. You lose your ability to practice as an actuary, all right? But you need a process for doing that. And finally, in the modern world, an actuarial profession needs to have some kind of public policy voice. That is, you want the profession to speak out on issues that are being considered by the public, that are being considered by the government, and to offer advice of one form or another uh, to make sure that you know our voice is heard and our expertise is understood. So those are the major components that you need to have a profession. Now, within the context of the United States, we have five actuarial organizations. I refer to it as American exceptionalism that we have five and everybody else just has one. That's not exactly the case. Spain has three. But um, most countries really just have one. Um, but there's a bit of division of labor, if you will. So the, the society of actuaries, our primary function is education. That is, we offer exams that lead to a designation. And research, research related to topics of actuarial interest. And more recently, we have expanded that to areas of societal, more broad, uh, more broad societal interest. So the SOA is about education and research. The Casualty Actuarial Society is similar, but they, uh, education and research, but whereas the SOA covers all, uh, we have six tracks or six major areas that we cover, which is kind of the universe, the Casualty Actuarial Society focuses on property casualty insurance alone, so they specialize in that. And they also have a, a, de a research uh, division. The public policy, discipline, code of conduct, um, I'm sorry, uh, public policy, discipline, and the actuarial standards are housed in what is called the American Academy of Actuaries. And as you heard, I'm a member of that organization. That, that's housed in there. The code of conduct 
belongs to all five organizations. So all five organizations use the same code of conduct. And so we're held to a similar standard. So the SOA's particular function then is education and research. We're the largest organization by membership, credential mem number of credential members in the world at a little over 32,000. Um, but we don't cover all of the areas that the, that the profession demands. Okay, so I just keep going. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next question that he asked me to address is one, I'm not sure I'm qualified to, ad to address it, but I will mention, I'll do what I can. Uh, the current status of the actual profession in the Caribbean and what would you like to see to the future, meaning me. Um, so as I mentioned just now, Caribbean actuaries have designations from other places, uh, traditionally the UK, you may a fellow of the institute, or what's now the institute and faculty, because the organizations in England and Scotland merged in 2010. Um, or um, many uh, Caribbean actors are fellows of the Canadian Institute of Actors, or fellows of the Society of Actors, and I'm, there are probably a few that are fellows of the Casualty Actual Society, small number. So the designations come from, come from all different places. Um, what I find to the credit of the actuarial profession in the Caribbean is that we've had actuaries in life insurance since the 1970s. And I say that because as I travel around the globe, there are several countries, particularly in Africa, where they don't have any actuaries. And, and, and there, uh, there are some places where the insurance companies don't think they need them, right? Um, that is generally not true in the Caribbean in respect of life insurance. It is somewhat true in the Caribbean in respect of property casualty insurance, where the companies may feel like they don't need actuaries. Um, now, what I find as a distinguishing feature of Caribbean actuaries is that perhaps because the nations that you, that you are in are small, Caribbean actuaries have a really good feel for their countries and their economies and their population and their people, how their people behave in certain circumstances. And these things are very critical. It's very important. Uh, actual science, being an actuar is not a theoretical exercise. It's an exercise in, under, again, what we try to do is advise businesses, and businesses are transacting business every day. And so, so, so the actuary is there to provide that advice, and so having that understanding uh, of how Trinidad works and how Jamaica works um, is very important. Um, I find that not to be the case in the US, because you can specialize in, for example, verbal annuities, just a single product, and you can work on that all your life and really not care about a whole lot that is going on outside of that. And so I consider that a significant strength of the Caribbean actuaries that I, I don't find elsewhere. So uh, in terms of um, what I'd like to see, <laughs> I guess the primary thing is I'd like to see a very strong Caribbean actuarial association. Um, I think the actuaries that as I meet them and as I've known them are all individually very strong. They know what they're doing. And so I'm hoping that that translates to continuing to build a strong Caribbean actuarial association. And um, y you'll, be, you'll be pleased to know that they, okay, so there's an organization called the International Actuarial Organization, uh, International Actuarial Association. And that is an association of associations. So the Society of Actuaries is a member. The Caribbean Actuarial Association is a member. And there are about 75 what are referred to as full members, so SOA and CAS. Now SOA, of course, is much larger. But I, I want to assure you that the, the voice of the Caribbean Actuarial, or Caribbean Actuarial Association is very well heard in that arena. Um, some of the representatives that we've sent up here, Kathleen and Lisa Wade, 
uh, they're very well respected for, for what they bring to the table. And so, um, so we have a good reputation in, in that area. Um, the profession globally is pretty small. The IAA has, as I said, 75 full members. And the way it works is that each association pays dues to this IAA, all right? And the dues are like 50,000, sorry, $50. Yeah, $50 per year per member. So the SOA has 32,000 members. So we take 32,000 times 50. We send that money off to the IAA. The CAA has how many members? Stokely, you have an idea? Is he here? You have an idea? About 200. About 200 members. You take 200 times 50 Canadian, you send that off to the, send that off to the IAA. If you add up those bases, right, the number of members across the 75 full member organizations. Last time I asked was about two years ago, and I don't think it has changed much. It's 115,000. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. So globally, the profession is quite small. And it's not going to double anytime soon. All right? So um, I, I, my belief is, and I tell people, I believe that every country on Earth needs a few fellows, needs a few people trained at that level, right? But it's not going to be the thousands that we have in the US, all right? It, that, that can be supported. And so, um, so there's going to be a few opportunities for some. And then what we hope is that in places like Trinidad, Jamaica, where we have actual science programs, that those students will make their way perhaps into other fields where they can use what they have learned to the benefit of your, of your societies. So that's as much I would, as I would say on the, on the CAA. OK. So here's the next one that came. I, I, so the questions were submitted by a number of, number of students here, so I'll just work through them. What's the future of the actual profession globally in light of new developments like AI? And the question asked about late stage capitalism. Is the person who asked that question here? Because I wanted to know what they meant by that. Late stage capitalism. What? They asked the question and they don't come for the answer. Okay. So artificial intelligence, and the third one that they asked about was climate change. And so, um, so what is the future of the pressure? These are very, very deep and important questions. And I'm going to talk about climate change, in, uh, uh, first of all, because one of the things that is generally true about actual science, well, one of the things that's universally true is that our work is assumption driven. We are invariably trying to develop assumptions in order to model out the future, all right? That is true if you are pricing, you're you're, you, if you're pricing a product or whatever, you're saying that these prices will generate a particular return, right? There's always some sort of uh, return objective to pricing. If you are reserving, you're saying this amount of assets will suffice to meet the needs. Whatever you're doing is always forward looking. Now the question then becomes, it's forward looking and of course we can't see the future, so all we can do is make assumptions about the future. So the question becomes, how do you get those assumptions? All right? And a reasonable answer is, well, let's look at past experience. All right? Well, it's reasonable if past experience can be expected to continue into the future. 
And that is generally true, or has been, <laughs> for things like mortality. It, it doesn't change a whole lot. And, and you can do that. And so acne, people at the Society of Actors, they get a whole bunch of mortality data, and they convert it into mortality tables, which then actuaries like Stokely and me use to calculate certain things. And we feel pretty comfortable because it's based on past experience. Climate change. The future is not going to reproduce the past. And so you can't just take the past experience and expect it to continue. So this presents a real challenge to the actuary because you still have to price products for the future. And just imagine, for example, homeowner's insurance, right? that is directly affected by whether there's a hurricane or some other storm that hits somebody's home. And so it does present a very real challenge to the actuarial profession. And there are a few actuaries who are beginning to sort of develop new ways of projecting that future. You do have to project that future, but you can't necessarily rely, uh, just rely on the past. Okay, so I'm going to turn now to a, a different topic, which has to do, which is about leadership. As president of the Society of Actors and president of other things before that, I'm, I'm first of all a leader, and what does that mean? So, what is leadership? What do you think? Give me a word for leadership. Word or two, anyone? Responsibility. Anything else? Empathy. Empathy. Anything else? Confidence. Sorry? Confidence. Confidence. All right. Anything else? Are you defining leadership or just attributes that you think leaders need to have? When you say confidence. Attributes, okay. Anyone else? Respect. Respect. Okay, I can deal with that. All right. Huh? Ambition. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to some extent you have to have that. So, so yeah, I, I, my first leadership role, I was about seven years old, and I was in the Cubs at my elementary school. And they asked me to be the leader of my team of six. And that was my first time. And then um, later on, as a teenager, I got elected president to my church youth group. And um, so I got you know, this whole idea of how you get elected and, or being elected, what that means, and what the responsibility of the, of the president is all about, and sort of leading the team, and so on and so forth. So. Um, but at that time, and you know, eventually I became president of the IABA, as you heard. And, um, and I think certainly as a teenager coming up, I, I never gave any thought to what is my philosophy of leadership. You just sort of did what you thought made sense, right? You just, you just did it as you, as you thought it should be done. And so um, my philosophy of leadership, I sort of evolve retrospectively looking back at what I have, what I have done. And I define it as um, leading is influencing. All right. Anything you can do to influence the direction of something, you're providing leadership whether you are the designated leader or not. If you are the president or not, or you're just a member or whatever. As long as you're providing, as long as you're influencing the direction of things, then, then you are leading. And so that's kind of my, the philosophy that I have. Um, and so anyone can be, be a leader in that sense. One of the things that I had as a challenge, my, my last job was as a 
life insurance regulator for the state of Minnesota. Now, the United States has 50 states plus Washington, D.C., plus five what are called territories. And so these 56 entities, each of them has its own insurance regulatory office, all right? So I was a life insurance regula regulator for the state of Minnesota. But all 56 entities come together under an umbrella organization called the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the NAIC. All right. So I was, I, I, most times that we were doing any kind of rulemaking or discussion of rules, it involved multiple states. And so, um, and so I would be in, in discussions with lots of actuaries from other states. And if it was something technical, like having to do with that surplus management that I talked about, or surplus evaluation, there would be technical experts. These are actuaries who, are, who, 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 who have deep technical knowledge on the subject, and usually there were committees from the American Academy of Actuaries. Now, of course, they're SOA members, right? The Academy doesn't have its own designation, but anyway. So you'd have these very, very deep technical committees, and then you'd have regulators. And it, it, it could be a broad range of subjects that I, as a regulator, had to give some kind of opinion on. So as a regulator, all of us, you know, we're trying to, so the question is, what do I do? How am I going to deal with this? And what I realized was that, you know, a lot of times you think of the leader as having all the answers. And you don't tell, leaders don't tell everybody what to do. But I decided on a different approach because what I wanted to do was to influence the process but I didn't necessarily have the answers. And so what I did very consciously was to lead, what I call lead, by asking questions. And so what I would do, if there was going to be an NAIC meeting on a particular topic, I would literally spend time before the meeting thinking about what questions can I ask that will influence the direction. Now, I don't have the answers, but I do know that, particularly with the technical expertise that is at hand, they'll have the answers, all right? And so what I tried to do was to ask questions that would move the direction in a positive direction, you know, move the uh, effort in a positive direction, something that was meaningful. And that, got, that actually got noticed. Uh, people noticed that John would get on the phone and ask good questions. It helped a whole lot that I talk differently from everybody else. Why did I run for SOA president? I don't know, so that I could come here and stand in front of you and brag about it. <laughs> um, you know, I've told you that leading, leading is influencing and um, and my leadership career started when I was about seven. Um, in 2010, well, when I, when I finished at UA, my first job was teaching high school. I taught O-level and A-level maths at Excelsior High School in Kingston. And I was only there for two years. And in the second year, they needed a member of staff to run on the school board because they had just started the practice of having staff represented on the school board. The government wanted that. So we had this election in the office and somebody nominated me and I, I, I didn't decline. Now, Excelsior is a pretty big school and there are teachers there 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? And this is my first ever, te I wasn't even a trained teacher, I'm in my second year, and they elected me. I don't know why, but that was quite a compliment to me, and it, it, sort, of, it sort of reflected their trust 
in they're, they're putting their trust that John is going to do the right thing for the staff. So I was, yeah, I was kind of impressed with that. I didn't stay long at Excel. So I actually left and, and went to another high school and then subsequently studied and never, never did get back to teaching. Um, so that was the second one where there was a significant election and somebody else saying, John, we, we, we think highly of you as a leader. Later on in 2010, well, 2006, I was elected vice president of the International Association of, International Association of Black Actuaries. That is a US organization that is, that cons whose membership is predominantly black actuaries. Membership is, in fact, open to all. But the mission of that organization is to increase the number and improve the careers of black actuaries. That's what, that's what it's for. And so I joined, started going regularly to their meetings, probably around 1995. Um, served as a friend of the board. So I would sit in and I could offer opinions. And, and then eventually was asked to be vice president. And then in 2009, I was elected to serve as president 2010, 11, 12, 13. Now, it's not a four-year term. It's four, each term I had to be re-elected, right? Um, but doing that work got me noticed by the Society of Actuaries, and uh, as you can imagine. And in 2012, I got an invitation to attend a reception at the SOA annual meeting a pre what I call a president's reception. And there were about a dozen, probably 15 people like me there. And they wanted to encourage us to run for the board, board of directors, SOA board. You have to be elected by the members. So I thought about it. And one of the people, one of the people who were there, his name is Mike McLaughlin. Has anyone heard that name? You may not have heard that name down here, but Mike McLaughlin is Jamaican, and he was the president of the SOA 2009 to 2010. And this is 2012. So and, and Mike and I, turns out, went to the same high school, St. George's College in Kingston. He's about five years ahead of me. So he was there. I said, Mike, what do you think? He said, John, we're looking for diversity, and I think you should run. So I put my name, put my hat in the ring. And at the time, the SOA was choosing six members out of 12 for the board. And I was fortunate to have been one of the six to be elected. So I served on the SOA board 2013 to 16. It's October 2013 to October 2016. And I think I was an effective and respected board member. One of the things that I, that I did fairly early on was start to talk about diversity in a way that I think, uh, w what I find with actuaries is that they're very fair-minded. And diversity is not a hard sell, for the most part. They believe in the basic equity, or we believe in the basic equity and fairness, and it makes sense to us. And so it was not a hard sell. But when I started talking about it at the board level, it was really the first time that the board was talking about it. So I feel like I was a catalyst for something that started in 2013 and continues, continues to this day. So I served effectively, I think, on the board. And then uh, at the end of that term, I tried running again. I wasn't successful. I tried running for president. I was not successful. Tried running as a board member again, was not successful. And then along comes the year 2021. So what was special about 2021? What happened in 2020? What? Uh, yeah, but something else. Thank you. So the murder of George Floyd occurred in May of 2020. And I live near Minneapolis, so where it happened was not far from my home. And you know what that caused around the world. I mean, everybody 
was talking about diversity and inequity and those types of concepts, right? People were tearing down statues in Belgium, right? It was a global, the reaction was global. And so coming into 2021, the president of the SOA had written the strong statement about diversity and the nominating committee, which there's a group called the nominating committee that decides who gets on the ballot, who gets to be voted for. And they were talking about diversity in a serious way. And I said, you know, if there's any year that my candidacy would be welcome, it's going to be 2021. What I had planned to do was to retire, which I did at the end of July, and return to the Caribbean to teach A-level maths like I did at Excelsior. But I changed course and I said, you know, if I'm ever going to be president, it's, it's going to be, this is going to be the best year. And so it was a little bit opportunistic. Um, I certainly appreciated the, the historic nature of what, what might happen. And there were three candidates, and I ended up ahead of the, ahead of, ahead of the other two. We, we made a deal. I, I, I will tell you, there was no rough rivalry among the three of us. We we're, were, were all very good friends in, in the profession, as it were. And we made a deal that the winner would buy dinner for the other two. So I kept that promise the other night. We were all at a meeting in Washington recently, uh, last month, and I, I had to take them out to dinner. They hit me up for 400 US dollars. Anyway. Uh, but then the, the person that came second, um, if, if you're going to the CAA meeting, you will meet him um, because he became president the following year. Uh, he was elected the year after me, Tim. And so um, he'll be coming to the CAA meeting. So that's more or less why I ran. And um, one of the questions you always ask yourself when you when you get this type of role is, what am I supposed to do? You know, what, how am I supposed to behave? Um, one of the things that's true about the SOA board and, and is generally true in nonprofits is that I don't go to the board representing a constituency. I'm not there to represent black actors. I am there using my particular perspective to look out for the organization as a whole, all right? We don't come in, represent you represent this, I represent that. No, it doesn't work that way. We are all trying to look out for the organization as a whole. And that's the spirit in which, in which we take it. So I find the board very insightful. I, I, I'm always surprised at some of the things that I hear from board members always quite profound and, and everybody trying to pull together to make the SOA better. Okay. So what's the job of the SOA president? What am I supposed to do? Um, as president, first of all, what I, I one election in 2021, the results came out September, there was a board meeting October. I was not on the board, but I attended as a guest. And at that meeting, they decided to change the title from president to president and chair. It took them two hours <laughs> to decide it. <laughs> but anyway. So one of the primary functions of the president is to chair the board meetings. There, I, for my year, there were four meetings, and I chaired all four. Um, the other one is to chair the leadership team, which is a small group. There's the presidential officers, the past president, current president, president-elect, plus two other board members. And we meet more like every two weeks. And I, I, my job was to chair those meetings. And then my third job, I would say, was to be the organization's number one ambassador. So I get sent around the world representing the SOA, um, speaking for the SOA in one way or another. 
All right. Now, there are a number of, th that sort of concludes the, the comments that I had. And um, there were a number of shorter questions here. You want me to go through these as well, or? I'll, I'll ask. Turn to the audience now. I'll ask some questions I myself had in listening to your speech. Okay. So, firstly, a couple times you said you were elected yes. uh, throughout your career. And my question is, what co personality characteristics do you think you have or have illustrated in the past that allowed people to think that you should be in a leadership position? Um, the first thing I'll say is that I have, I have somehow acquired a pretty wide network. Um, when it comes to being president of the SOA, a lot of it is about name recognition. Does someone know anything at all about John Robinson? And somehow, um, through my personal connections with actors around the world, uh, I've been able to get that sort of presence. So a lot of people kind of recognize the name. Uh, the way the SOA does it for president, uh, your photo is also there, right? So when they announce the candidates, now check this out. They announced it in alphabetical order, all right? I am of the surname. I am Robinson. And you would think I might be last. But the next one was Rosar, <laughs> R-O-Z, which come after me. And the other one was Sandberg, which is S. So I ended up being the first person that all of the members saw as the three, uh, first of the three candidates that they saw running for president of the SOE. And I think that helped. So some things for a little fortuitous. So between having a, a pretty extensive network, I have a habit of going to, if I'm going to a strange country and I don't know anybody, I go in the SOA directory and I find someone that lives there. And I said, I'm coming to town. Would you please host me for dinner? Yes. <laughs> Not because I'm president, but I'm, I'm coming. And so I've done that a few times. And, um, and of course, they're very gracious to, 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 um, to have, me, have me over for dinner. Um, so I, 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 keep a, I keep a network that way. There's people that know me. Um, but the other thing is just what you mentioned there about confidence. Just the idea that, you know, I think I am not, I, I can do the job just like anybody else. I don't have to do it the same way as anybody else. I can do the job. And so having that confidence will say, yes, I'm going to put my hat in the ring. Um, this is my year, and that is exactly how it turned out. OK. Thank you for that answer. My, my second question is, upon leaving secondary school in Jamaica, you said you, you taught for two years, right? And so you taught for two years there. Obviously, you would have had interacted with the culture. And you left, and you went to America. My question is, what's the difference in work culture between probably Jamaica or the Caribbean as a whole versus in America? The difference in work culture, the ethic. That's my question. No, you talk about, you, talk, you know, I left, a, I, I taught high school, so that was kind of the only work I had. I would not teach in the United States. No, no. No, students are, consider themselves too entitled. No, no, no. I, I want students that I can beat down and get them to do the work, right? <laughs> I don't want to hear no foolishness about, oh, I, I got to deal with TikTok. No, I'm not into that. No, 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 no. So I, I, I generally would not want to teach in the United States. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, right. OK, and another one I had, and I think this would be pretty relevant to most UE students here. What are some of the challenges you had in becoming a fellow of the Society of Actuaries? OK. Um, the, the, the process is intentionally arduous. Uh, we want people who are well steeped and well trained in, in what we're asking them to do. So it's intentionally rigorous. And that is true whether it's the institute and faculty, the actual site of South Africa, 
the SOA, the CAS, all Australia, all of those organizations have very rigorous programs. So it's always, it's always going to be challenging. Um, what was the rest of the question? Some of the challenges you right. yourself experienced. And so in my case, I did my first exam, I told you, I did when I was at Florida State. And I was doing a master's in statistics. So I did the statistics exam, which at that time was called course two. And I got a 10. And I went back to Jamaica. And 10, of course, is the highest passing grade. I went back to Jamaica, and there were four more exams for, fellowship, for associateship. And I got three tens and an eight. So my resume had four tens and an eight. <laughs> and so part of it was just the fact that those exams were a lot of mathematics and statistics related. And, and I could lean into them fairly easily. So I got my ASA in 1984. Now, fellowship was a totally different ball game. Um, the material is all different. Um, the method of answer is essay questions now, none of this multiple choice thing, right? And the method of preparing for the exams is very different. For the associateship exams, it's similar to what you would do at A level. Practice, 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 right? Once you get to the fellowship exams, it's a whole different type of ball game. And I, I did not adapt to, the new, to this new environment very well. So initially, I did my first fellowship exam in 1986, and I, I didn't pass. And, and then 1987, I may have passed one. And then 1988, I didn't pass. And in 1989, I may have passed one. And, and I wasn't passing on a consistent basis. And I realized it was because my study technique was incorrect. What I needed to do was to create a set of notes. And this, this may sound a little horrible. I needed to create a, a sort of condensed set of notes and just memorize the heck out of that thing and walk into the exam and then answer any question that was put in front of me. And once I did that, then I started passing with regularity. But I didn't get my fellowship then. I got ASA 84. I didn't get my fellowship until 1994. So I am not an example of the ideal student. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was all on me. It was the fact, as I looked at what other students were doing, what my colleagues were doing, that's exactly what they were doing. And I wasn't doing it. And I said, well, hey, that must be the way to do it. And so I figured out um, what is the right technique in order to enable me to be successful at the fellowship level. So the short lesson is what you do at the associateship level is not what's going to take you through the fellowship level. You've got to switch to something else. And um, the sooner you adapt to that something else is the more rapid your success is going to be. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. I really want to thank you for giving us all that advice and that knowledge. Do they get to in. ask questions or we yeah, finish? Of course, okay. of course. We don't leave it out the audience at all. And throughout your entire career, it's been, it's been really good, really informative. Notwithstanding, I'm sure the audience, the secondary school uh, students, as well as um, our UV body right here, we would have a lot of questions to ask. So we'll open up the Q&A session right now. So anyone, if you all have a question for the immediate past president of the SOA. Yeah, on the chat as well. Yeah. yeah. So, hands up, I'll come to you, and you'll get the mic to ask the question. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Tressa. Tressa? Tressa. Tressa. Yeah. Okay. You said earlier that before you were elected to be the president, you were planning to retire and to go teach A-level maths. But why A-level maths and not like lecture at a university? Um, my experience teaching A-level maths was great at Excelsior. These are kids who are competent in mathematics, and they are at the point where they are considering career choices, right? And I think, um, I, I think, first of all, the idea of teaching competent students is appealing. 
Um, I'm not a certified teacher, so I can't take on you know anything else that that's that's going to be satisfying. And just that stage of life, I, I think I like to be an influence again, leading and influencing in, into their choices. So that's why. The other major concern I have for the Caribbean is something that I witnessed in 2014. I went to the graduation ceremony at the University of the West Indies in Mona. And I went with a friend of mine. His daughter was graduating. And so we sat in the audience. And they were celebrating the fact that the graduating class that year, the percentage of males was 13. And that was an improvement. And that caught my attention. And so to the extent that I can do anything to influence males to get into tertiary education at all, the Caribbean needs that. Afternoon, Mr. Robinson. Sure. My name is Jabari Austin. Um, you should remember that for future reference. During your story, you made um, two references to situations where your resilience showed. Um, the first one being the step from associ associate to fellowship, where it took you that, that 10 year span, where you kept trying with the exams, trying with the exams, and the second year with the second instance with the I'm going up for the presidency of the SOA. Yes, sir. they went for the board, they missed. They went for the presidency, they missed. They went for the board, they missed. Um, my question being, is this resilience, did it spawn from any situation from your past life, or is this something that you were, that you were born into, that you grew into, that you felt necessary, that you saw that this actuary um, profession is something that you see yourself making a positive change that you need to do it? even though it wasn't something that of your initial plans when you finish university and even after such. So my question is, what motivates you do to go that extra, push that extra, take an extra step to yeah. make that extra push to get these, these things done? Um, I, I, I think the shortest answer is that I got my ASA in 1984, and I got my fellowship in 1994. It didn't need to take 10 years. And I know, I, I, I'm aware of at least one individual who, who I know got their fellowship after taking exams for 20 years. All right? So I, I understand from that what that persistence matters. And I think that's what it was. That, you know, I was, I was not going to not be a fellow. That was not going to happen. From the day I met Daisy Coke in 1974, I was going to be a fellow. I was not going to settle for anything else, no matter how long it took. Now, it doesn't have to take that long, and I point that out, because part of the reason it took that long was my own lack of proper preparation. All right, So some of it was on me. But still, I think it's important, if, if anyone wants to take up this challenge, it's going to be tough, not undoable. Not, it's doable, but it's going to be tough. And it's going to be, you know, so there will be times when you're going to probably feel like quitting, and you say, no, I want to continue. So anything hard like that is going to take that sort of thing out of you. Running a marathon, training for a marathon, it's going to be hard. So I think that's what it is. Does anyone else have any questions? There's a hand. Oh, yeah, multiple. You? You're closest. Hey, hi. Good afternoon, Mr. Robinson. I watched your video. Well, there was a video on the SOA YouTube channel where you were like passing the baton to the next president. Um, and you mentioned that one of the things you were most proud of was changing like the pathway to get the FSA like title. And I was wondering how come you wanted in the first place to change the pathway to get the title? So that's my question. 
All right. So l l let me let me clarify a little bit about what that pathway change is. All right. Um, when I was coming up, well, actually, when I started, there were what ten exams. That's it. Everybody did the same ten exams. All right. Gradually, the process evolved, and the SOA's process does evolve, and it does change from time to time, to where you get your associateship, and that's a common set of exams. But then for fellowship, they had six specialty tracks. So you could do life, in, uh, I don't know if I can name them, life on annuities, health, group benefits, retirement, quantitative finance, and investment, and I'm missing one. <laughs> ERM. ERM. OK, so, so, and what the SOA said was each candidate has to choose one track, all right? So if you choose the life insurance track, you're not going to do anything in pensions. If you do the pensions track, you're not going to do anything in life insurance. And my argument, I wrote to the SOA several years ago, and I said, this is not, this is not the best way to do it. And the reality is that while specialization may be meaningful in the context of the United States, I was finding, for example, when I talked to my brethren in Nigeria, he says, hey, the company has health, P and C and life, and they want me to do all of them, right? So I made the point that forcing people to study a single track decreases the organization's global relevance because we're not meeting the needs of 90% of the countries out there if we force people to specialize. And that is why I have said several times in speeches that the change that they made to not require this specialization is my favorite change. And what has happened now is the new system will have four exams. Two of them will be required to be from one specialty, but the other two will not. So you can actually now get some kind of specialized education in three fields. You could say, I'm going to do two life insurance, one pensions, and one PNC. And particularly for actuaries who might be thinking of consulting, and particularly if you're thinking of consulting in a place like Trinidad, right? it's useful to be able to offer multiple things because now you can attract multiple clients. So that's what I mean by global relevance. Hands up, all those who have a question. There's one here. Please. All right. He's making his way down, I guess. Uh, hello, my name is Akim Filbert Jr. And uh, I wanted to know about actuarial science and how affected it is by the growth of artificial intelligence. You said that some companies, uh, especially in the Caribbean, don't really like take certain actuaries for certain uh, jo jobs. I think one was, I think, property insurance in Trinidad and Tobago. Com and I just wanted to know how much of a risk of AI and how much it will affect uh, actuaries in general. Okay. So the impact of, uh, of artificial intelligence on the actual profession. Um, there are a lot of people now very busy trying to figure out the answer to that. There's not going to be one answer. I think the question is, how should you use it, and how should we not use it? All right? Now, I'm going to start from the premise that the, the value proposition of an actuary is that we study all these disciplines, right? Economics, I mentioned them. And we synthesize them. In other words, we connect the dots as to how all these things work for the benefit of the um, business leaders and companies and clients that we advise. All right? 
that sort of synthesis cannot be, formed, cannot be performed by artificial intelligence. So my belief is that value proposition will continue to be strong. Um, my limited experience with AI is that I, I, I did a little experiment, just a little, I'm not into it much, and I, I, I'm, I'm retired, I'm done with that. But um, I did an experiment of asking it a question, and it gave me an answer. And the question had to do with a certain person in, in history. And I asked the person, I asked Chat GPT, if you like, tell me about so and so. And he gave me this very glowing, it gave me this very glowing review. Now I happen to know something that that person did, which is not so nice, which is not in, in history is not. So I said, how come you didn't mention that other thing? So Chat GPT came back to me and said, oh, I apologize for the oversight. <laughs> and a few more things. So then, my last question was the same as my first question. Tell me about so and so. Very different answer, all right? So I concluded that AI and ChatGPT in, in particular is not necessarily a source of truth on the first bite, all right? And that makes things, that, that changes the game quite a lot. You can't just ask it a question, get the answer, and expect that the answer is right. So I think what's going to happen is that, you know, they're going to play around with AI and try all kinds of things. And there may be a limited number of things that you can count on AI to do well for you, do quickly for you, and we will hone in on those and say these are they. But it's still early days. Uh, folks are experimenting. The chat GPT, there's a public version. There's also a, a private version that has more powerful tools. People are coming up with more powerful things all the time. But I do not think that there is anything out there that's going to replace the value proposition of, the, of a fellow and the synthesizing of different things, as I mentioned just now. Down here, I had a question, unless you finish. Uh, I, mean, I just want to make a quick co um, comment on, on that point. Sure. The, the question that you asked was a similar question that was asked uh, um, that when I was going to study and to leave Fatima and, and, and start studying actual science, people were saying, well, with the advent of computer technology, the field is going to become obsolete. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The more powerful the tools became, and the people that were, had the expertise to use the tool, the more powerful the users became, right? The actuaries, got of, uh, the actuaries become obsolete because uh, the calculator was invented? No. It meant they were able to do more powerful calculations. I think the same will be true with AI. AI was actually around when I was in university. And it's just evolved the same way the abacus has evolved into the scientific calcula, calculator. It hasn't made actuaries obsolete. It's made them more powerful. I'll just leave you with that thought. Yeah, this gentleman here has been raising his hand for ages. OK, I'll, I'll Come on, quit go? denying him. Hi, yes, um, my name is Nicholas James. Um, my only question is, uh, could you give us an idea of how many new members the SOE, SOA gets like every year, yearly, monthly, and how often do new members join? I, I do not have the answer to that. Um, I will say this. Um, what, I can, what I can partially answer is that in order to become a fellow, the last step of the process is what's called a fellowship admissions course. Now, you're already an ASA, and you're already a member. So when you become a fellow, you just become a different class of member, all right? And there are, I would want to say, two or three of these fellowship admission courses every year. And I attended one last year, and I attended one this year, and each one had about 160 
new fellows. Now again, that's not new members, that's just new fellows. So at that rate, you're talking about 500 to 600 new fellows per year. And, and that is globally. I mean, you know, wherever they are, they have to do that fellowship admissions course. That much I do know. But I, I do not know the corresponding number for ASAs, because those would be new members. Yes? In a given year. I don't know what that is. If you really want to know, send me an email. You can find my email address on the SOA website, and I can ask the powers that be inside the SOA to answer that for us. Good day, Mr. Robinson. My name is Nirvan Sernan. Okay. In the beginning, you spoke of, spoke of the different specializations and how they pl each of them play a special role towards society. My question is, in your opinion, which specialty has had the greatest impact to society? And also, if you had to influence a specialization, which would it be? I don't have any, any way to measure the former in terms of impact. Um, I don't know if you could measure impact simply by the number of people who are in each specialty. And I don't happen to know what that is. Now, I will say the property casualty business um, The, there is a whole separate society, the Casualty Actuarial Society, that specialize in property casualty. And they must have, I think, about 7,000 members, where we have 32,000 members. Uh, but of course, we have diff six different specialties. So impact, um, I'm not sure I have a good metric even to begin to measure that. But what I will say is that, um, as a general premise, uh, and this is something that, you know, a lot of times we think about the mathematics and we think about the challenge of the exams. But the reality is that whatever area you're working in, as long as it's, well, it's, as long as it's somewhat related to insurance, pension, sort of the traditional thing, which is most people, and perhaps even beyond that, the impact that we have on the world is many, many, many times our number. Because if you just take life insurance alone across the globe, we are keeping life insurance companies solvent. We play a critical role. And that means financial security for all those policyholders. We are trying to keep pension plans solvent, provided the companies follow our advice. And that is providing retirement security for millions of folks. So the impact of the profession globally is many, many times the number of actuaries that we have. And that's something that we need to be proud of as a profession. So our society, that is what I refer to as our societal purpose. I think people have started using this term societal purpose as if it's something new and it's, you know, it's only climate change or, or, or what can you do other than the traditional things. And I argue that the traditional things that we do provides tremendous societal purpose. And that is, if, if nothing, for no other reason, that's a good reason to get into it. It's not because you're going to get well paid. It's because you're going to be serving a group of policyholders that are looking to you they don't even know that they're looking to you, but you're the one behind the scenes making sure that regulations are followed, prices are appropriate, reserves are right, surpluses are right, and keeping management honest, or at least advising them as best you can. So I have a question. All right. In light of what is uh, just said, that actuaries are well paid, my, my question is, why exactly are actuaries so well compensated? Why? Yeah. Wh because why we're worth it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> eh? You know, they, they, okay, so the reality is that the, the market places a value on our services, all right? We don't do it ourselves in a vacuum. The market places a value. 
I, as a life insurance regulator, unfortunately, <laughs> the market places a lower value on my services working for the government than many actuaries, senior actuaries in many companies. All right? um, I love the regulator role because you know, they're getting paid the big bucks, right? They're getting paid the big bucks, and I get to make the rules that tells them what to do. So that's kind of sweet, <laughs> right? I have that influence. So I'm willing to trade a few dollars for influence, all right? But it's really the market that decides what folks get paid in the long run. And um, it's, not, it's not just us. But I, I don't think there's any actuary that's not worth what they're being paid. OK. Thank you. Afternoon again, Mr. Robinson. You again? <laughs> Me again. So um, you were speaking about the rigorousness of the exams as well as the high demand of actuaries, yet the very low number of that there is, that there are globally. Would these um, statistics ever reach a point where the SOA would decide to make these exams a little less rigorous? <laughs> to make the market a bit more accessible by those trying to become actuaries? No. <laughs> No, you, you no, 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 stop, no, no. Listen, listen to what you're asking for, all right? Right? Would you like a doctor to be less well-trained to be a doctor? <laughs> Surgery, is that right? You, no, well, yeah, just a um, hot saw instead of a, a scalpel? Is that okay with you? No, 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 that's not what we want. That's not what we want. No, well, just compare what we to do, like... What we do want, and one of the, one of the, one of the challenges, I think, with some of the volume of, of reading that we ask um, candidates to do is that some of it might well be redundant. In other words, you don't, read, you don't really need to read so much stuff. And I think in the new FSA pathway, some of the uh, volumes of what we ask folks to read will be less. But it's not going to be any less difficult, not going to be any less rigorous. And nobody would want that, especially you. If you were an act, think of it as an actuary, and you 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 feel that what you're doing was not was not you know what you did, what you studied was not rigorous. No, you want to know that for yourself, and society wants to know that for all of us. Thank you. You're very welcome. Twice. <laughs> More questions. Okay, one at the, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. online. Online, we'll come back to this. Afternoon, Mr. Robinson. Uh, my name is Christian Neoto. Uh, I was just wondering if you could outline the process of bridging the gap between getting your college degree, doing your exams, and joining a actual society. And in the case of countries like America and Spain, where you mentioned there were more than just one, how you would go about deciding which to join and whether that decision would be final or if you could change it. Okay. So let's just uh, sort of generally walk through the process of how one becomes an actuary. Um, typically, you will do a first degree of some sort. Um, an actual science degree is not necessarily required, um, but you will do a degree of some sort. Now, the next stage will be that you will try to find an employer to take you on, all right? Now, the reason, there are two reasons for that. First, in order to be an actuary, you have to be employed as an actuary, all right, in general. The exceptions that I would make to that is perhaps actuaries who work in academia, who are pursuing something, you know, research and teaching, things like that. But in just thinking of actuaries in industry for the moment, um, you want an, an employer to take you on. And you want the employer to do two things. One is to employ you, you know, give you money, but also to support you through the exams. It is virtually impossible to go through all the exams, certainly to fellowship and probably not even to associateship, um, without employer support. 
the employer, a good employer, will pay for your exams, will pay for the materials that you need to study for the exams, will give you time off of work to study for the exam. These are what we call actuarial development programs. I benefited from one in my little company in Jamaica. And when I went to the US, I benefited from one at Nationwide as well. So those inputs are almost necessary. You cannot work 60 hours a week and take fellowship exams. It just doesn't work, all right? So those sorts of inputs. So that's the pathway that you're trying to follow. Um, so I hope you get the impression that it is less about the particular organization than that process. You choose at some point that you're going to do the exams of the Society of Actuaries, or you're going to do the exams of the Casualty Actuarial Society, or you know, maybe you think you're going to do the exams of the IFOA in England. That's part of it. Part of that is also which ones is your employer going to support. All right. So in general, that is the process. Does that answer your question, or am I missing any part of it? OK. OK, I can ask um, the online questions on behalf of our viewing audience on YouTube and on the Zoom webinar. So firstly, from a, a viewer from Nigeria, they ask, in a country like Nigeria, where one does not really have access to a mentor in the field, what can one do? Or can you suggest or recommend a roadmap to become an actuary within a stipulated time? Um, from the discussion that I just had, there are a couple things that are pretty much 100% needed. You need to be employed as an actuary. You won't be employed as a teacher and take actuarial exams. It's not going to happen. And so, if my friend from Nigeria wants to become an actuary, at some point you have to engage with an actuarial employer that will take you on. Now once you're inside that company, whether it's a, an insurance company, a consulting firm, or whatever, then you might seek a mentor within the company, or as you get into the community of folks who are taking exams or others, you may find mentors um, it, for, for example, I could be a mentor for someone in Nigeria, all right? Um, but, but the critical steps are going to be um, getting into employment. And so, um, anyway, yeah, that's how I would answer that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, some others from our viewers on Zoom. Were there any misconceptions that you had from before becoming an actuary that you may have realized only during your career? misconceptions that you had prior to becoming an actuary no i can't think of any misconceptions i will say that when i started out nobody talked about an actuary as being a business person and i i came to that understanding several years into it and i share that understanding with people wishing to enter that profession now because that is critical to your approach. I say you have to be employed as an actuary. You can't just go to an employer and say, I can do math, give me work. It doesn't work that way anymore. If you go to a life insurance company, you need to be able to say, hey, I know a little bit about life insurance. I know what universal life is. I know what traditional life is. I know what term life is. I have some rough idea. And part of it is just the competition. But part of it is you want to persuade the employer that you know something. Why would you go work for a car company and not know what a car is? You know, that's my analogy. And so, um, so you, 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 gotta, you gotta show them a little bit. So I wouldn't say it was a misconception, but I will say that when I started out, uh, nobody really expected me to know anything about or have an interest in business. That came along later. And they're asking about your work-life balance. How did you manage preparing for examinations, um, managing your work and your personal life? Um, so I came back to Jamaica in 82, and I married the Jamaican honey in 83. And our first daughter was born in April of 84. 
I got my associateship as a result of the fall sitting of 1984, November. Rachel was born in April. And um, I, I think the first thing to say is that it is virtually impossible to get through this process uh, unless you're single the whole way, without the support of your family. It really, it truly is a family commitment. So that's the first thing that you and your partner need to understand if you're, if you're going to engage in that. Um, wh what I did, um, I guess one, one little story I'll tell. Um, Rachel was born in April, and I was doing an exam in November. And you know, in the early days, babies sleep when they want. And then after a few weeks, they kind of figure out a sleep pattern. So Rachel had a, no, my wife was working. Uh, so she was not a stay-at-home mom. And, um, and so Rachel eventually developed a little routine. Every night at midnight, she would wake up and need to be changed. So I built my study around her routine. So I would go to bed. I'd come home and have dinner. I'd go to bed around 8. I'd nap until about 10. I would get up at 10. I'd start to study, you know, whatever I needed studying. Midnight. <laughs> so I would get Rachel up. I would change her. I'd feed her, put her back to bed, put her back to sleep, and continue studying until about 2 in the morning, and then I'd go to bed. So what I tried to do was just integrate my, you know, paternal responsibilities with my studying in that way. Each situation is going to be different, but it's possible. Okay, and final question. You mentioned the SOA bridging the gap between specialties within SOA pathways. Has there been any consideration to bridge the gap between SOA and CAS, that is, between life and annuities and property and casualty? Okay. So two answers to that question. The, the first answer to that question is that the SOA does offer property casualty. We use the term general insurance. And so if your questioner is looking for property casualty in the context of the SOA, it's referred to as general insurance. Okay, So we do offer that. Uh, we don't have a lot of take up on it. Um, traditionally, the Casualty Actuarial Society, by virtue of their specialty, Folks who are interested in that tend to use tend to use the Casualty Actuarial Society. Um, on the, for the for the CAS, I think it's fair to say that you know being a specialty it can be a blessing, but sometimes it can be a curse that you're only one thing, and so sometimes the CAS struggles with that. Now the other part of your question, which I don't know if that was what they intended, was we've had over the years. Uh, discussions and attempts at merging the two organizations, all right? And they've been unsuccessful. The first one that I'm aware of that, that, that happened um, was 2011. And uh, the president of the SOA, as you've, you've probably gathered, is the largest of our organizations in the world. And some people ascribe to that a certain amount of power. So the president of the SOA got up, and instead of giving a speech about you know, family and slavery that I did, he went up and declared, without sharing that notion with anyone, that the, the SOA, the academy, and the CAS must merge. He did that on his own. Needless to say, it caused a huge amount of consternation and bad feeling that just because he was president, and not only that, he, like I say, he had not even consulted the board. So that was not the position of the board of directors of the SOA, that was just his personal position. And it caused a lot of bad feeling among the organizations for many years, and I think some of that bad feeling persists until today. There was a second attempt around 2018, and this time the leaders of the SOA and the leaders of the CAS were actually talking to each other. And they basically said what, what you might think is a logical fit, that if the CAS merges with us, then the CAS will provide that property casualty component that the SOA didn't have. We now have one, right? So 
on the surface, it would seem like a, a decent way to do things. But the reality of mergers of this type is that organizations have cultures, right? And almost invariably, when you have one large, powerful organization and one smaller, less powerful organization, the, the culture of the smaller one is going to get swallowed up in the culture of the larger one. And so, as you can imagine, the CAS is a smaller organization. They're very proud of their organization. They really like their organization. And the thought of being absorbed into another bigger organization and losing some of that cultural character was too much for them. And so the SOA board voted to approve. And the CAS board, now, <laughs> one thing the CAS board did was they consulted with their members. So the CAS board sent out a survey and said, what do you think? And basically, the members, enough of the members said, hell no, to where the board said no. So their board turned it down, and, and so that ended there. There is no appetite at this time for any type of you know, discussions of that type. And so each organization just proceeds on its own. But um, you know, it's, it's all very respectful, at least. You know, I, on, my, on my term, nothing blew up, which is nice. <laughs> um, every once in a while, you know, because there are five organizations, somebody does something that another one doesn't like, thinks it's their turf, and things like that. But we've we've been at peace now for <laughs> we've been at peace now for some time, and I, I expect that to. There's no reason for that not to continue, but merging is is not in the cards. Okay, thank you. And okay, come on. Good afternoon, Mr. Robinson. My name is Ariel Welch. Um, okay. You mentioned that there was a 10-year gap between your associates and fellowship. Do you ever think that you missed certain milestones in life while preparing for your associate or fellowship, fellowship exams due to how rigorous the exams are or how intense your preparation would have needed to be or any regrets you may have looking back or does the satisfaction of knowing you completed this large accomplishment fill those gaps? You know, I've, I've never really thought about it that way. Um, like I say, I, I know someone who took 20 years, and for me it was more like 12. And so for me, it's kind of par for the course to be that persistent. Um, do I feel like I missed out on things by spending all that time on exams? I, I really have not not try to think about it. I raised a family over that time. And, um, and you know, I, I, I don't find any point in going back and wishing that things were different. Um, it's kind of funny. You know, you take 10 years to get your fellowship, and, you know, maybe that's on the high end, but then you become president, so what the heck? We are running, drawing closer to the end of the event. So we'll take everyone who has a question. Could you put your hands up, please? One, two, two. Okay, perfect. Those will be the last two questions. All right. Good afternoon again. My name is Liam Pinto. So you mentioned that there's a pretty big shortage of actuaries nowadays. So. I'm wondering, particularly in the Caribbean, if there's been any efforts to increase engagement or make it more accessible for secondary and university students to sort of get into actuarial science, whether it's through internships or scholarships or even competitions. Yeah. You know, I don't think I said there was a shortage. I said the profession is small, and I really don't think that 
you know, the, the demand for actuaries is going to double in such a way that we now have 80,000 globally, all of a sudden we need 160,000. I don't think that's going to happen. So I do think that the limiting factor on whether you get into an actuary, a career as an actuary is going to be whether you can be employed as an actuary. It's going to be driven by employers. Because if you're not employed as an actuary, unless you're doing research or teaching as Stokely is, you're not an actuary. And so it's going to be driven by the demand that comes from the companies. Now, as I move around the world, I find that there are um, countries in which there are several companies that, and even life insurance companies, that don't think they need actuaries. And I think that makes no sense. And the reason I say that is that life insurance regulation, and I'm a part of, a part of that machine, is only getting more and more complex. And if it's getting more and more complex and you don't think you need the brains to help you figure it out, at some point your business is going to crash. And so those companies will either change their minds and hire actuaries, or they, will either, they may go out of business, or they may merge with, become a larger entity and then hire actuaries, right? So, um, so, 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 so the limiting factor to becoming an actuary is going to be the demand by employers. That's what it's going to be. And the SOA doesn't control that. Um, we encourage as many people as can to take the exams. We have, a, we have um, the SOA sponsors what's, well, recognize what's called Centers of Actuarial Excellence. So we promote excellence in the, in the academic presentation of actuarial science. But we can't tell employers what to do. And in the end, that's what's going to decide it. Yeah? Um, good day. My name is Jamie Smart. And my question was, why actuarial sciences? And why not anything else in the field? Because before you talked about how you enjoy that there are actuarial programs, and even though you nurture young actuaries, and if they can't make it to the actuarial levels, they are at least still somewhat certified. So why you yourself decided to go to the top, top, and aim for becoming an actuarial scientist? What is the alternative that you suggest? Well, um, for example, CPA. Um, yeah, why not? Yeah, why, why went straight to the top and not like an accountant? OK. Well, well, that's a different profession. No. Uh, it, I, if you want to be an accountant, be an accountant. An accountant is about history. So the, accountant, the accountant's job ends with the financial statements that concern the past, whether it's the past year or the past six months or whatever, all right? They are looking at income statements and balance sheets and so on that are studying the financial history and record keeping and all of that of the past. The actuary, as I said earlier, is forward looking. The accountant is not forward looking. So those are not comparable, all right? So if you want to be an accountant, that's a different universe. If you want to be an actuary, that's a different universe. Now, there's nothing quite like an actuary. There is no other field that takes mathematics, computer science, economics, investments, biology, law, and combines them into one profession. There's nothing else like it in the world, all right? And we are few, but that's about as many as the world needs at this time, in that general number. Does that help you? All right. Mr. Robinson, I have a question. Is there some sort of subliminal beef between accountants and actuaries? Because every time an actuary is mistaken in some way for an accountant, there's a sort of uproar. That's my question. Is there any such thing? Uh, some, sometimes actuaries think we are accountants. <laughs> I actually had a, a discussion the other day with some accountants, and I said, why are you doing things this way? And I concluded, well, that's how they do it. So what can I say? So um, sometimes actuaries think they are smarter than accountants, but the accountants have their own job to do in their own way. 
And uh, it, just as with any other profession, we, we need to be about respecting what the other profession is all about rather than trying to, trying to outdo them. But sometimes that little friction occurs. <laughs> okay, Mr. Robinson. Well, on behalf of the UE Actuarial Science Club, we really want to express our gratitude for taking your time to come and talk to each and every one of us today, for even crossing seas to come and talk to all of us. We have a token of appreciation oh, for you. Okay. Yep. So right. if you will accept, this is our gift from us to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with a little joke that I've, I've told a couple of places, and you may or may not have heard it. But um, um, they say that I'm the first black president of the SOA. And so I, um, soon after my election was announced, I got an email from Betty in the CAA saying that there was a gentleman named Edmund M. McConney, who was the McConney, who was the president of the SOA, and she said in 1947, and he was from St. Kitts. So I said, let me check this out. So of course, I Googled him. I didn't ask ChatGPT. I wasn't using it all the time. <laughs> I Googled him, and his census record for the year 1940 came up. And it had Ancestry.com. So obviously it was a document that was somewhere within Ancestry.com's domain. And the name was matched, and it said that he was born in 1893. Now this is 1940, the census record for 1940. So he was 47 years old. And he had him born in St. Kitts, so that made sense. And he was living in Iowa, I could tell, Des Moines, Iowa, I think. And on the US Census, you always put your race. And he had on his race white. So all right. So that's the first piece of evidence. Um, but he was president. He was the first president of the SOA, not in 1947, but in 1949. So that was true. That's when the SOA was founded as an SOA, it was a merger of two other organizations. So he was its first president. So that's one data point. I'm not the first Jamaican to be president of the SOA, because the first Jamaican, his name is Sedley Michael McLaughlin, and he and I went to the same high school, I think I mentioned that earlier. But he's what you'd call a white Jamaican. Now, does he have any black in him? I I don't know. It's possible. He, the, he tells me that the McLaughlins came to Jamaica from Cayman, the Cayman Islands. And that's how come he grew up in Jamaica. I'm not the first person of African descent because 2014 to 15, the president, his name is Errol Kramer, he's still alive. He was a, he is a white South African. So I'm not the first of African descent. So I don't know. I mean, in the US, they have this thing, well, if you have one little drop of black, you're black, right? So I have to, I have to suspect that, I mean, even with Errol Kramer, I don't know, he's a little black, some little hunky-punky in the past. I don't know, right? I, I don't know. It's quite possible. So it's possible that I'm not the first black president. But I'm pretty sure that I'm the first openly black president. <laughs> so I'll go with that. I thank you all for your kind attention. And um, thank you for having me, Stokely. Thank you for inviting me to this great event. And I guess I will be seeing some of you at the CAA annual meeting in the next few days. Thank you all. Okay, so everyone, food will be coming to the front. We have some, <laughs> yeah, we have some refreshments, and we have drinks behind. You have an announcement, picture, picture. Oh, yes, With course. this, you, yes. yeah.
Yes, yes, I want a picture of you too. All right. All right. Who's taking it? Robin, who's taking it? Have, I think we have a professional photographer. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That works for me. Take it out. Is this your choice? You got anything to do with this? No, unfortunately. No? Okay. Go and get the photographer's attention. Oh, it's a shirt. Thanks. Can I try to get the photographer's attention? What? Oh, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. You're the professional. Your size, everything. Yeah, my size, everything. Okay.